will speak on pediatric cardiac care pushing boundaries. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Am I audible and is the slide visible? Yes, sir. Slides are visible. visible. You're audible, sir. Thank you. See, interventional cardiology has undergone a sea change in the last uh, three decades, and which uh, what started off as simple angioplasty today has had several developments. And I will briefly highlight what changes have happened and what are the developments in this field and what are the facilities which we have today in our institution. The first thoracic iatrography was done from the radial artery in 1948 in Sweden, which started off the field of intervention. And subsequently, the first selective coronary angiogram happened on October 30th, 1958, when Mason Soans, when he was working in the lab, performed an iatogram, and accidentally the catheter went into the right coronary artery, and the injection was given into the right coronary artery. So this is accidentally how a right coronary angiogram was performed. Subsequently, uh, the first uh, Judkins catheters were developed in 67, and the first CABG was done in 1967. And Andreas Grunzig, who we all know, successfully performed the world's first PTCA in 1977 in Switzerland. This was the patient who had a first coronary angioplasty. You can see here, this was the stenosis. This was dilated. And uh, this was an angiogram 10 years later. The vessel was still patent. And this patient is still alive today, uh, who had his angioplasty in 1977, is still alive uh, today. At that time, the procedure was very crude, very uh, stiff catheters were only available, which were made by Grunzig himself in the kitchen table. And this was what was used in the initial angioplasties. And in 1986, the first stainless steel stent was inserted into a human artery. And the problem with the stents uh, was restenosis. And because of this, the drug eluting stents were developed and the drug eluting stent revolution happened. So this is how PCI evolved, balloon angioplasty, bare metal stents in 1994, drug eluting stents came in 2003. Drug eluting balloons came in 2009. Subsequently, bioresorbable stents, what we call the uh, stents which dissolve after a year or so, came. But due to some side effects, the bioresorbable stents are currently on hold and have not made a major uh, way. So this is how a stent looks inside, inside the artery. It gets endothelialized sometime after it's deployed. And this resorbable stent, uh, as you can see here, the struts have resolved, and this uh, leaves a native artery. See, all angioplasties before uh, 20 years were done through the femoral artery. The patient had to lie down flat after the procedure. Bleeding complications <laughs> from the femoral puncture used to be there. And because of this, slowly the procedure got shifted to the radial artery. And the first radial angioplasty was done by Kiminen in Amsterdam in 1992. And subsequently, in India also, we have been doing radial angioplasties for two decades now. However, the radial artery is slightly smaller and more superficial. And the advantage is because it's not a terminal artery, even when uh, damage happens to the radial artery, there is collateral circulation from the ulnar artery and the palmar arch to take care of the palm. So the complications do not uh, are not much with radial artery intervention. Patients can ambulate very easily. There is significant reduction in the bleeding risk and significant benefit, especially in primary angioplasty. And the patient can literally walk out of the cath lab after the procedure. Now, let us look at some of the developments which have happened in angioplasty. Initial days, as we saw in Grunzig's case, angioplasty was done only for simple lesions. 
this subsequently evolved and nowadays we are able to do angioplasty for a lot of complex lesions this is one example of a bifurcation you can see a circumflex om bifurcation lesion here and we can use two wires two balloons do a kissing balloon inflation simultaneously deploy stents with multiple techniques in both the branches this is how it is done and then we can get a result like this you can see here both the branches are fully open and patent so bifurcation angioplasty has now become very common now the other problem which we face lesions like this calcified lesions always used to be treated by surgery before nowadays we have a lot of tools to take care of calcified lesions in the coronary arteries this is one example a 82 year old man was a hypertensive had exertional angina in 99 had an angioplasty done elsewhere in march 2000 he had chest pain in 2009 again uh, managed medically and in 2019 he again had angina he declined intervention and was managed medically subsequently because his symptoms became severe he agreed for an angioplasty and you can see here there's a heavily calcified right coronary artery even before injection you can see the calcium the vessel is literally seen even without the dye so the entire vessel has calcium so we were able to cross this lesion with great difficulty you can see a wire across and then we use what we call a rotablator burr to burr the calcium so here you can see the burr going backwards and forwards we try to get across the lesion this burr is diamond coated and we spin it from outside it spins at about 160,000 to 200,000 rpm and because of the uh, diamond burr it's able to cut the calcium pulverize it into small uh, bits which then goes into the circulation even after five runs it was difficult to get across this lesion you can see the calcium still there finally we were able to cross with the burr as you will see shortly at 190,000 rpm you can see the burrs pecking 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 and see it has gone through so we are able to burr the lesion and then we deployed two stents in this artery and this was the second stent and this was the final result you can see a really excellent uh, outcome of this angioplasty now next tool which we have to take care of uh, calcium is what we call intravascular lithotripsy you would have ho heard about lithotripsy being used to break renal stones this is a similar principle the lesion is crossed this patient had a stent and the stent did not expand because of calcium so we can use an intravascular lithotripsy balloon which uh, creates sound waves which go through the medium of uh, contrast in the balloon and exerts uh, 50 atmospheres pressure on the vessel wall and you can see the balloon has yielded and the calcium has broken so we use this intravascular lithotripsy now to break extensive calcium which is there in the arteries so this is one other tool which we have to take care of calcium and this was the result in that patient the stent opened very well Another area in angioplasty which has developed is vessels which have been occluded chronically, what we call chronic total occlusion. These are present in about 15 to 20% of our coronary angiograms and some of them need intervention. And owing to uncertainty of success because this lesion vessel has been occluded for several years, the vessel becomes calcified. It becomes very difficult to cross the occlusion. This was always sent for surgery before now we are able to intervene in these patients and some patients who have angina with a cto some patients with documented ischemia and lv dysfunction they all do better with revascularization and the success rates of cto intervention have gone up over the years to as high as 85 to 90 percent this is one such case where we always inject in both the coronary arteries when we do a cto intervention this is the left coronary you can see the right coronary is completely occluded in this segment and we are able to see the collateral filling and this we were able to cross anti-gradely itself and deploy stents after ballooning and you can see here after the stent there's an excellent result in that vessel which was completely occluded
sometimes the occlusion has become so calcified we are not able to cross with multiple wires anti-gradely this is one such case this patient had a proximal LA deletion and the right coronary chronic total occlusion we fixed the left anterior descending artery first and then you can see here this, we fix that left anterior descending artery and for the right coronary artery instead of crossing from here anti-gradely what we have done is come retrogradely you can see here the wire coming through a septal collateral from the LAD and then we go through the septal collateral into the distal right coronary artery come retrogradely here and cross the occlusion And then we have exteriorized that wire and then we dilate with a balloon and then perform the procedure anti-gradely and we have got stents here and you can see the result in this vessel and this is what we call a retrograde uh, approach angioplasty which is available for uh, chronic total occlusions. Next area which has developed is left main angioplasty. Previously all left main coronary uh, procedures were sent for surgery. Now, in select patients who are high risk for surgery or who do not want surgery, we are able to do these left main interventions percutaneously. Now, apart from angioplasty, we have uh, several other tools. I'll look at some of these tools. One is fractional flow reserve. We come across patients with a tight stenosis. There's no problem. We go ahead and do an angioplasty. Somebody who has only a 10, 20% stenosis, we can leave them alone. The problem comes in intermediate stenosis when it is 40 to 60, 70 percent. We are not sure whether the lesion is significant, whether intervention is required. So in these patients, we use what is called a fractional flow reserve where we cross the lesion with a pressure wire and we measure the pressure gradient proximal and distal to the stenosis. And this gives us an indication whether the lesion is functionally significant and whether we need whether it needs treatment. So you can look at this angiogram. This patient had multiple lesions in the LAD, in the circumflex, and in the right coronary artery. You can see all these lesions. And FFR, instead of blindly going and stenting all these lesions, what we can do is do an FFR. And FFR shows uh, more than 0.82, then the lesion is not significant. So we found that this lesion is not significant. This lesion was not significant. This lesion had an FFR of 0.88, not significant. Only the distal RCA had an FFR of 0.5, which was significant. And only that lesion uh, was fixed in this patient. So FFR helps us to identify which lesion to treat, especially when the stenosis is intermediate in nature we need not rely on just the fluoroscopic image now we have certain other tools what where we can literally image the coronary artery from inside what we call intravascular ultrasound and we pass it pass this through the guiding catheter through which we do the angioplasty we are able to see things like tissue protrusion molar position edge dissection when the stent is deployed we are able to measure the artery as you can see here and we are able to size uh, the artery properly and deploy the right size stent and achieve very good results. Another tool which we also have here in our hospital is optima, optimal OCT or optimal coherence tomography. And here, instead of ultrasound, light waves are used and we look at the coronary artery from inside literally like a camera. There's no X-ray used. Image acquisition is fast. Images acquired are very sharp and detailed and easy to interpret. I'll show you some examples. You can see here calcium and lipid plaque. This is basically a cross section of the artery inside. You can see the imaging catheter. You can see the guide wire shadow there. And you can see all the three layers of the artery nicely, the intima, media, and adventitia. And you can see the back scatter. You can see the plaque, which is... Uh, low attenuation plaque here in the artery you can see calcium you can see detect a fibrous plaque and you here you can see the stent uh, which is smaller post on top at the 12 o'clock position in the left side image and in the right side image you can see the stent is undersized so if we leave the stent like this they will be prone to stent thrombosis so once we see this with an oct we can go back dilate with a bigger balloon 
and oppose the stent very well to the artery. So this, uh, all these imaging tools help us to uh, perform the angioplasty better and help us to get very good uh, results. Again, when patients come with the instant restenosis, you can see in this picture, you can see the stent struts and you can see the uh, tissue which has grown inside the stent struts. So again, this patient, there is thrombosis inside the stent. You can see the stent struts marked and you can see the thrombus inside, again, which is marked. This is the stent strut. And again, you can see here another red thrombus which absorbs infrared light and there's a high back scatter. This is shown as appears as a bright mass and the shadow cannot be seen behind it. Here you can see an edge dissection at the edge of the stent. Again, if this is left like that, the patient can develop a stent thrombosis and occlusion, vessel occlusion. So this can also be taken care of. So OCT is very useful tool for PCI optimization. And we have been using this in our hospital for the last three years. Some other areas where there has been a lot of development is uh, robot assisted PCI, which currently is very uh, expensive. But the advantage is one is precision, but more than that, it will reduce the uh, radiation to the operator because he can perform the procedure from outside the lab in the console room and thereby reduce the radiation to the operator. This is how the robotic arm is there and you can see the operator can sit in the console outside, literally like playing a video game and operate the console from inside using the robotic arm and perform the angioplasty. Now, the latest tool uh, which we have, which you would have seen uh, recently in some ads also, is the laser. Laser also has its applications in cardiology and we would be uh, procuring a laser very soon, uh, which should be uh, installed in our hospital shortly. And this will be the first laser installation in Tamil Nadu outside of Chennai. And what are the advantages of this uh, laser? Because laser is used to vaporize the thrombus, in, especially in acute MI angioplasty when there's a lot of thrombus. Usually what we do is we aspirate the thrombus, we give chemicals, we have a lot of trouble in restoring distal flow. Once we have the laser, we can literally vaporize the thrombus using the uh, laser. It can also be used in lesions where there is instant restenosis. And in some lesions where we are able to cross with the wire, but not able to cross with other uh, balloons and so on to perform the angioplasty, we can use a laser to cut through the lesion. This laser can also be used in extracting old pacemaker leads which have been deployed with or which are infected several year old leads to be very difficult to retrieve these leads so the laser also helps to uh, retrieve these leads one other area where cardiology has seen a lot of development is valve implantation because previously all uh, valve surgeries were done surgically by opening the uh, chest and especially in high risk patients, patients who are not fit for surgery, patients who have multiple comorbidities. Today, we are able to uh, perform the valve replacement per entirely percutaneously just through a puncture in the groin. So this is how we uh, are able to approach the, approach the valve from the groin this is, we have crossed the valve from the iota, femoral artery, iota, we've crossed the valve. This is a balloon which is used to dilate the stenostiotic valve. And once this is done, with some cases we do a dilatation, some cases do not require a dilatation. We can take a valve percutaneously without any incision through the femoral root. You can see the valve, this is an image of the valve going up. The valve is crimped and mounted on a balloon. Uh, on a balloon. And this is how, this is a case which we did recently. This was an 86 year old gentleman who had severe iatic stenosis for several years. Finally, he came for the procedure when his quality of life was so bad. He had great difficulty. You've seen the valve crossed and you can see the valve mounted on the balloon. You can see the valve 
which has got deployed. You can see the valve open now. And this patient literally had a cardiac arrest because this valve was so tight. And once the valve crossed the native aortic valve, we had to literally deploy the valve during CPR. And this patient had a, a good result and he recovered in 24 to 48 hours. He went home on day three and he's now back to his routine life. And these procedures can also be done now. And we are doing this transcatheter aortic valve implantation in our hospital also. So all these uh, latest tools which you have seen like intravascular imaging using IVES, OCT, transcatheter uh, aortic valve implantation and laser, all these are available in our setup and we are able to uh, do procedures with uh, great ease and uh, helps us to get very good results for these patients also. And as one other area which has seen a lot of development is primary angioplasty. Because previously we used to, uh, all acute MI patients, we used to thrombolize and then take up for angiogram. Nowadays, any patient who walks into our hospital with an acute MI, round the clock, whether it's one o'clock on a Sunday morning, we offer primary angioplasty and almost all patients now are, uh, are done with primary angioplasty and we have literally not been thrombolizing anybody for the last uh, few years and these patients have a very fast recovery and they're able to go home very soon after their MI and the LV function is also significantly good when they come uh, fast to us. So in short, these are, I've just shown a, a snippet of some of the developments which have happened in this field, which started from just an angiogram, which used to be done for sending the patient for surgery. And then angioplasty came in for simple lesions. Today, we are able to do complex lesions, bifurcations, calcified lesions, left main angioplasty, valve implantations. And ultimately, it's a teamwork because we do this along with the surgical team and there are indications where we send patients for surgery and there are indications where the surgeon sends patients to us. Ultimately, uh, we discuss and take a decision and it's basically a teamwork where we make, work together and get uh, good results for the patient. Thank you. Now, I'll any uh, comments from anybody, I'd be happy to uh, answer and then Dr. Vijay will take over for the second part of the talk. There are no comments, then Dr. Vijay will be taking over for the second part of our talk. But, uh, Vijay is our uh, uh, senior pediatric cardiac surgeon and he's been with us for the last few years and he's done several uh, complex procedures and he'll be the apt person to talk on what is uh, what are the developments in pediatric cardiac surgery of late and uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Vijay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balaji, sir, for uh, for the uh, introduction. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction. It is always a tough act to speak after uh, Dr. Balaji's lecture and to maintain the same high standard. But I'll try to do my best. Uh, I have no uh, disclosures and patient information and photographs are displayed after due permission. In today's talk, I would be focusing on innovations across generations, which pushed boundaries to initiate and improve cardiac care in children to reach the uh, present highly developed status of uh, pediatric cardiac care. Initially, I would cover the histor historical path breaking procedures and then discuss the present state of uh, pediatric cardiac surgery uh, in context to uh, India and in our hospital setup and finally end the lecture with a discussion about the avenues of avenues for future innovation which gives us good hope to further improve the quality of uh, care in children with 
cardiac ailments. So to start with, the history of pediatric cardiology is rich and fascinating. It is fair to say that our own era of complex diagnostic imaging combined with sophisticated intensive care and neonatal open heart surgery comprises a very small portion of the timeline. It is historically important to realize that in the early years of the 20th century, every child born with a congenital heart defect was destined to succumb to its effect. The only variable was timing. It died either within hours or some patients lived uh, for a handful of years. But definitely that is not the situation now. A lot of improvement has occurred. In the modern, what are the changes then? In the modern era, the partnership between surgery and cardiac critical care has resulted in dramatically improved outcomes with ICU mortality measured in single digit percentages. That is the worldwide standard now, and that is the standard which we maintain in Ramakrishna Hospital also. The dramatic progression in the management of the patient with a singly, uh, with a functionally single ventricle has evolved hand in glove with new insights into the complex physiology of the heart as well as the pulmonary, pulmonary and systemic circulations in these challenging patients. Managing a single ventricle uh, patients is always uh, a, quite a task. So uh, this, let me uh, first describe the path breaking first procedure related to pediatric cardiac surgery. This was done by one Dr. Robert E. Gross of Children's Hospital in Boston, successfully ligated the patent ducted, ductus arteriosus, or we called as the PDA in 1938. And that, that accomplishment ushered in the era of surgery for congenital heart diseases. Do, his colleague was one Dr. Tosig, who was a cardiologist and a pediatrician. And she had uh, made clinical observations that some children with cyanotic congenital heart diseases became progressively more cyanotic coincidentally with the closure of the PDA. And uh, taking into cognizance of uh, Gross, Dr. Gross's benchmark uh, contribution of uh, ligating the PDA, uh, Dr. Tosig wanted to construct, construct an, uh, an arterial duct again so as to augment the pulmonary blood flow. But uh, Dr. Gross was very skeptical. So Dr. Tosig went to John Hopkins in Washington and uh, um, spoke to Dr. Blalock and convinced him to uh, take, undertake this landmark procedure. So with Dr. Alfred Blalock, who was the surgeon, and the wisdom of his assistant, Vivian Thomas. This is an interesting story. Uh, uh, Vivian Thomas was a non-medical person, but his contribution to pediatric cardiac uh, surgery is very significant. Uh, Dr. Alfred Blalock and Dr. Viv and Vivian Thomas combinedly performed the first surgery, pediatric cardiac surgery, which we call now as Blalock Tosic shunt. And this procedure revolutionized the care of the cyanotic child with the construction of the subclavian artery to pulmonary artery end to side anastomosis, thus augmenting pulmonary blood flow, and and it brought about a significant improvement in the cyanosis. Uh, this is uh, pioneers of pediatric cardiac surgery, uh, Dr. Blalock and uh, Dr. Gross. And uh, uh, she is the uh, cardiologist, Dr. Tosig. The original idea of uh, uh, BT shunt wa was hers, and the technical development was, was by Vivian Thomas. And as I told you, it, he was an African American lab assistant, he was not a doctor. This, the surgical star was Alfred, Alfred uh, Blalock, and the patient whom, on whom the surgery was performed, the first surgery was performed, Blalock, BT shunt, first BT shunt was performed was Elin Saxon. So, so with, the, with the starting of uh, the pediatric cardiac surgery, and once the uh, 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 medical fraternity understood that uh, uh, children with heart diseases can undergo procedures successfully, then uh, continuous innovations were attempted. And the next major innovation was the heart-lung machine or the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. The advent of the heart-lung uh, machine in the mid-1950s. Move on here. Stop sharing. Sorry, sir. Uh, I'll just correct it.
Now, are you able to see the heart lung mission slide? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. So, uh, sorry for the technical problem previously. The next major innovation uh, for uh, in pediatric cardiac surgery is the advent of the heart lung machine. This was done in mid 1950s, and this marked the birth of successful open heart surgery and the genesis of congenital heart disease is as a subspeciality. The first successful application of the heart lung machine was by Dr. John Gibbon Jr. when he repaired an atrial septal defect in a young woman in 1953. Dr. Another pioneer uh, uh, was uh, Dr. Walton Lilihai. He is called as the father of open heart surgery. Dr. Lilihai used a very innovative technique uh, for uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. So if the heart has to be stopped and opened and repaired, uh, the circulation has to be transferred to somewhere else. Dr. Lil, uh, Lilihai used the patient's parents as a support system so that they, the parents' heart pumped blood both for them as well as for the patient. This technique is called as cross circulation. In this approach, the patient was connected to a human donor preferably a parent, who served as a living oxygenator. In 1954 to 55, Dr. Lilihai used this method to repair at least 45 hearts with, congenital, uh, with complex intracardiac defects. You can see the technique in the picture. It's blood taken from the patient and it was uh, introduced into the parent and then the parent's heart pumped the oxygenate, the lungs, uh, the parent's lungs and the heart oxygenated and pumped the blood back into the patient while the heart was being repaired. Uh, Dr. Lilihe also was the first surgeon to successfully close a ventricular septal defect, do a total repair of tetralogy of fallow and also a, a complex defect, namely a complete AV canal defect. Uh, Dr. Lilihe's contributions continued and he helped the pioneer hemodilution and moderate hypothermia for open heart surgery. And no wonder he, Dr. Walton Nillihai is called as the father of open heart surgery. Now, with this uh, historical information, let us go to the present scenario and briefly discuss about the status of pediatric cardiac surgery in India and in our center. Uh, in India, one in thousand live birth children have congenital heart defects. Considering the huge population, there is definitely a significant burden of children with congenital heart defects. Very few pediatric cardiac centers are performing the entire spectrum of therapeutic procedures. And I can confidently say that Ramakrishna Hospital is one such center. Uh, uh, the important uh, next milestone should be an, um, uh, government and insurance companies participation in pediatric care is the need of the hour. And if that, is, that happens, more centers uh, will definitely take up pediatric cardiac work. So with few centers available, there is definitely a huge burden on the uh, limited resources. So the common surgeries performed are ASD, ASD VSD, PDA closures and closures of other uh, shunt lesions like uh, uh, iota pulmonary window, uh, complex repair of uh, AV canal, atrioventricular canal defects, Total anomalous pulmonary venous connection repair. This TAPVC repair has to be done in, in a neonatal stage or, uh, or uh, before the child crosses the uh, infancy stage. And uh, correction of various anatomy, anatomic variants of uh, transposition of great arteries. Correction of complex heart diseases is routine are routinely done except the Norwood procedure. Uh, Norwood procedures uh, are uh, done uh, only in very select centers because uh, it, it is not a single uh, procedure. It entails uh, continuous care and at least three procedures have to be done for that patient to lead a near normal life. And so Norwood procedure is infrequently performed. That is the only procedure which is infrequently performed in, in our country. Uh, fountain procedures are routinely done. This is for the single ventricular correction. So uh, let us uh, uh, discuss about some interesting cases which we did in our center. This is a patient, 10 years old patient with diagnosed to have iota pulmonary window. See, uh, this is the pulmonary artery and this is the iota. There is a communication. Actually, uh, the, the name describes the condition. There is a window between the 
pulmonary artery and the aorta. Usually this type of lesion, there is a high uh, shunt across the opening and the patient develops uh, pulmonary hypertension very early on. So it has to be done before the uh, child uh, crosses the infancy stage or at least before uh, three to four months. Um, so usually uh, the technique is you place a cloth-like material with, at the gap and close the shunt. This patient uh, was undiagnosed till 10 years of age and then uh, we took the patient for surgery and uh, the patient underwent uh, surgery successfully and is now uh, uh, feeling uh, is now much better and is coming for follow up regularly. Uh, this is another interesting case, uh, a neonate, a 20 day old neonate. You can see uh, this is the iota. But the RPA was arising from the ascending iota. So this is the iota and the RPA was arising from the iota. So the entire right ventricular volume was being pumped into the left pulmonary artery and the RPA was uh, getting blood from the iota. So the RPA was uh, exposed to high uh, pressure and the LPA was also exposed to high pressure because of the increased volume overload. So this is a critical situation where the uh, patient has developed severe pulmonary hypertension early on, even in the uh, even within a few days after birth. So that uh, sort of uh, lesion has to be corrected very early on in the neonatal state, stage itself. So uh, the patient was taken up for uh, surgery and the RPA was disconnected uh, from the iota and then re-implanted in the main pulmonary artery. The child uh, did well and is now uh, gaining weight appropriately. This is another uh, delay, uh, delayed presentation of a complex defect. Uh, this patient uh, had a complete AV canal uh, defect with severe PAH and severe uh, mitral valve regurgitation and it presented only 12 years of age. So in spite of uh, both the parents being educated, the, uh, they couldn't uh, identify the disease early on and uh, even though it was a late presentation, we took up the patient for surgery, underwent a two patch repair. The child uh, did well, but uh, because of the late presentation and the late correction, the, there is persistent severe PAH and there is moderate amount of left um, AV valve or mitral regurgitation. So the lesson learned from this patient is any uh, shunt lesions or uh, uh, congenital heart disease patient has to be uh, seen by the specialist early on and treatment advised. The uh, delaying doesn't help uh, anyone. So uh, valve repairs uh, in pediatric age group, uh, uh, val valve replacement is uh, mostly avoided and uh, it is always uh, valve repair and valve repairs are routinely done. Here we can see the mitral valve and uh, there is a ring being implanted around the annulus to maintain the competency of the mitral valve. And uh, PDA uh, uh, has to be dealt with if the patient is sim uh, symptomatic because of the uh, patency. This patient uh, spectrum can be a preterm baby to adults also. So uh, even a 500, 600 gram uh, patient uh, can have a patent PDA and if medical treatment fails, then such babies, that such tiny tot has to be taken up for surgery and the PDA has to be clipped to prevent complications. So this is one case, a uh, preterm baby of around eight, only 800 grams. So we, uh, with an open PDA, we took the patient and then uh, did the PDA clipping. The child did well after that. So this is another interesting uh, case. Uh, and this was a two month old baby. Um, the baby was diagnosed to have a right atrial tumor. You can see uh, the, the heart arrested and the right atrium open and this is the tumor, a globular mass occupying the entire right atrium. So uh, the child was severely symptomatic uh, with the features of uh, cardiac failure. So the child had to undergo surgery, uh, surgery early on and hence the child was taken up for surgery and the tumor was excised in uh, total. The uh, post-op histopathology revealed that the tumor was capillary hemangioma. Capillary hemangioma is a very rare cardiac tumor and it accounts for only 2% of all cardiac tumors. Cardiac tumors per se is, is rare and among the cardiac tumors, this capillary hemangioma is still rare. 
So lucky, uh, lucky for the patient, it is a benign condition. And once uh, the tumor was excised completely, the child uh, is better. So tetralogy of fallow, uh, this is one of the most commonest uh, conditions which we see. And one of the most commonest uh, surgeries which we do is complete repair of tetralogy of fallow. We, the age group ranges from neonates to adults with uh, uh, this condition. Early complete, but always it's as I said before, early complete repair is the treatment of choice. Apart from natural survivors, many patients present with intense cyanosis and and because of cyanosis and uh, uh, polycythemia and its complications occur. Uh, recently, uh, we operated on a patient with uh, brain abscess as a complication of uh, uh, polycythemia and sluggish flow in the brain vessels. This this boy. Is a 12 years old boy from the neighboring country. He was a case of neglected tetralogy of fallow, and he had polycythemic. Poly, he, he was polycythemic with intense cyanosis. He had developed brain abscess. So uh, initially, brain abscess was treated, and then uh, he underwent uh, cardiac correction. So another challenging uh, avenue in the pediatric cardiac surgery is the neonatal cardiac surgery and uh, we do neonatal cardiac surgery routinely and one hallmarks a neonatal cardiac surgery is the arterial switch operation for transposition of great arteries. The arterial switch operation was first introduced by Dr. William Mustard in Toronto in 1952 uh, but unfortunately that uh, surgery didn't and that patient did not survive. The first successful switch was performed by Dr. Adib Jatin of Brazil in a 42-day-old infant with transposition of great arteries and ventricular septal defect in 1975. This marked the beginning of an early, uh, of an era of early primary repair of co complex congenital heart defects in the neonatal stage itself. Uh, Ramakrishna Hospital uh, was the first one to perform uh, um, arterial switch operation in the uh, western part of Tamil Nadu. This was done in late 1990s itself. And we routinely performed a neonatal uh, cardiac surgeries here. So there is an urgent need for more centers to take up neonatal cardiac surgery as the patient load is very high. Uh, in our center, trans catheter cardiac procedures are also being routinely done. A short history about uh, such procedures. The first successful trans catheter cardiac procedures were balloon atrial septostomy by Dr. William Rashkind in 1966. Patent ductus arterios closure using an Evlon plug in 1967 and atrial uh, defect closure uh, by Dr. Terry Dean King in 1975. The, the, what are the transcatheter procedures commonly done? They include uh, closure of uh, atrial septal defects, certain VSDs, uh, certain PDA, and uh, coarctation of iota dilatation. If the anatomy is suitable for transcatheter uh, procedures, uh, Closure of these defects by transcatheter procedure is the first choice. If the anatomy is not suitable, then the second option of uh, surgery comes. So what are the uh, uh, future avenues for uh, growth in pediatric cardiac surgery? Let us uh, discuss for another 5 to 10 minutes. So uh, biventricular conversion in borderline single ventricular hearts. Uh, if a patient has a single ventricular anatomy, Till now, the patient was corrected with a fountain procedure. But now, uh, there, is being, there is an attempt being done to convert the single ventricle uh, to, con uh, to a biventricular anatomy after suitable training of the left ventricle. The, um, there is significant improvement in the uh, mechanical support uh, system of the heart, especially ECMO and ventricular assist devices, uh, transplantation uh, there is a significant scope for development in pediatric cardiac transplantation and fetal interventions are increasingly being done. So coming to biventricular conversion, biventricular, bioventricular anatomy is always uh, sustainable when compared to a single ventricular correction and the patient is much better in a biventricular situation because it mimics the normal anatomy. So biventricular conversion is done in smallish borderline left ventricular anatomy. Uh, which is done, as I told you before, only after suitable left ventricular rehabilitation. Uh, left ventricular rehabilitation uh, means uh, to increase the size of the LV and also the increase the size, increase the thickness of the LV wall. 
studies have proven patients have a better quality of life after by week conversion. Uh, pioneering work is being done at Boston Children's Hospital now. Uh, transplantation. Clinical heart transplantation was first accomplished by Dr. Christian Bernard in 1967. Infant heart transplantation was first attempted by uh, Dr. Adrian Kantrowitz on December 6, 1967 uh, in Brooklyn, New York. They performed the first pediatric heart, heart transplant in a 17-day-old infant with the Epstein anomaly who lived just for six hours, but it was an, a new procedure. Nowadays, uh, transplantation has grown in numbers in the pediatric age group, and pediatric heart transplantation represents a small 14%, but a uh, very important and a particular part in the field of cardiac transplantation. This treatment has lifelong impact on children. To achieve the best short and especially long-term survival and adequate quality of life, which is of crucial importance for this young patient population, one has to realize and understand the differences with adult heart transplantation. Adult heart, heart transplantation is different from pediatric heart transplantation. Hospitalization among children suffering from heart failure due to congenital heart disease is increasing and pediatric heart transplantation may remain the only option for some of these young patients. In 2011, 565 heart transplantation in patients below 18 years were reported to the Registry of International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation and significantly, 25% of the patients were infant recipients. So what are the indications for transplantation? Cardiomyopathies like uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, heart failure in single ventricular correction, uh, complex congenital heart diseases like uh, advanced stage Epstein's anomaly, and sometimes in uh, advanced uh, shunt lesions where there is a significant uh, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension with ease and mangerization, then there is an uh, there is the only treatment which can we can offer for such patients is a combined heart and lung transplantation. So the next uh, avenue uh, of uh, innovation or uh, development is the mechanical support system for the heart. If the heart uh, fails, then we connect the heart to a mechanical uh, pumping uh, system. Uh, it, this mechanical sub, uh, support system can be called as an ECMO. ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Or for a long-term support, we connect the patient to a VAD. VAD is a ventricular assist device. So the ECMO can be an eCPR. What is eCPR? When we are doing, uh, 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 when, when a patient had suffered cardiac arrest and when we are doing a CPR, if the patient is not uh, reviving, then we have no other option but to substitute the cardiac function with a mechanical support system. And at that situation, in an emergency situation, we connect the patient to a ECMO. That is called as eCPR. Uh, in uh, post-cardiac surgery, ECMO is preferred when the heart is and when we are not able to wean off cardiopulmonary bypass mission. And sometimes ECMO is also used as a bridge to transplantation. Uh, ECMO can be delivered by uh, a percutaneous venous and arterial cannulation through the neck or femoral vessels. ECMO may be beneficial when there is hypotension despite inotropes and also in respiratory failure. So ECMO support is the hallmark uh, support system and it should be limited to patients with cardiac respiratory, cardiorespiratory failure. For acute and potentially reversible diseases, a patient can be supported with a temporary ventricular assist device, especially if, you, if we foresee a, a longer period of uh, mechanical support. So uh, when a brief discussion about the ventricular assist devices, the evolution of surgical repair and medical management in congenital heart disease and the availability of cardiac transplantation as a treatment option in the end-stage heart disease have increased the need for mechanical cardiopulmonary support in pediatric patients. As we venture into correction for more complex uh, diseases, the need for mechanical uh, support is, is increasingly required. So in the absence of a mechanical support system, uh, the uh, trying uh, and the repair of a complex uh, heart defect has its uh, own very high risk. So, in the, uh, in the in previously, in the absence of appropriate sized ventricular assist devices for pediatric patients, ECMO was was widely used. But nowadays, the ventricular assist device uh, have been innovated very much, and the size of the ventricular assist device have been brought down. 
so that they can they are used in uh, pediatric patients also durable implantable vads have become a standard mode of care for advanced heart failure in the current era 30 to 50 percent of patients listed for heart transplant utilize a bridge to transplant strategy and a vad is one of the strategy short term uh, ventricular acid device are used for acute processes Usually, we, we can anticipate uh, to support the child for uh, uh, more, two weeks or more. And if, uh, if it is within two weeks, then we use the centrifugal flow pumps. Uh, the commonly used ventricular acid devices include a rotor flow or a centrimag. These pumps require central cannulation and can be used in children of all sizes from neonates to adolescents. Uh, the other devices which are used include a HeartMate 2, and HeartMate 2 can be also used in adolescent patients up to a body surface area of 1.2 meter square. And the, now, the Toratec company has released a third generation uh, centrifugal pump, which is uh, called as the HeartMate 3, uh, and it can be placed in the pericardial cavity. But the most commonly used ventricular assist device is the Berlin Heart X Core. And it's a, it's a, it is a pulsatile, pneumatically driven paracorporeal ventricular assist device. It is the most commonly used pediatric ventricular assist device throughout the world. And, uh, and the only long-term FDA-approved VAD for neonates and infants in the United States. So this is an, um, a pictorial description of the uh, uh, Berlin heart. So uh, this is the... Uh, hardware which is attached to the patient. There's a tube which is inserted into the uh, left ventricle and from this, from the left ventricle blood is taken and it goes to the driveway and then it is pumped back into the iota. So it's, uh, basically it functions the uh, function, it does the function of the left ventricle, takes blood from the left ventricle, pumps it into the iota. And this is the pump and the membrane, filter membrane. This is the uh, stationary console. It's a computer uh, which guides the uh, functioning of the uh, ventricular assist device. This is a mobile unit. Now, you can see a patient with a Berlin heart implanted who, who is walking uh, in the ICU. And the next uh, area of uh, innovation is the fetal cardiac interventions. Fetal cardiac intervention and cardiac surgery is an emerging branch. Uh, as you all know, cardiac development is completed by eight weeks of gestation. With developed fetal imaging like uh, fetal echocardiography and fetal MRI, most congenital heart disease can be detected by the 12th week. Primary morphological changes in the heart during the fetal period like valvular lesions can cause secondary changes in the heart like ventricular hyperplasia. Therefore, an early intervention for the valve uh, will prevent secondary changes. Hence comes the fetal cardiac interventions. And most commonly used interventions are, are uh, fetal aortic uh, stenosis, uh, dilatation, and also for hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And certain uh, interventions are also being done for pulmonary atresia with an intact ventricle septum. And interventions are also uh, being done for fetal arrhythmias like fetal tachycardia, bradycardia, and also for heart failure. So a brief history about fetal cardiac intervention. First time fetal cardiac intervention was done in 1975 for fetal ventricular tachycardia. In 1987, uh, fetal cardiac pacing was done for the first time for a, a baby with a complete heart block and which was inducing fetal high drops. The first successful fetal uh, balloon aortic dilatation was done uh, 25 years ago. So this is how uh, this is a pictorial representation of the uh, fetal uh, heart intervention. So transabdominal through the uterus, a catheter is introduced into the heart and then a balloon in, is introduced and then this is the iota and the aortic valve is dilated. So as I said, uh, um, fetal uh, aortic valve, valvuloplasty or balloon dilatation of the aortic valve can be done for uh, uh, babies with uh, severe aortic stenosis which can evolve into a hyperplastic left heart syndrome. So if we take care of the valvular stenosis early on, its secondary effects can be uh, prevented. Usually fetal aortic valvular plasty is done between 21 to 32 weeks of age. Uh, 
this is a rare surgery performed at Cleveland Clinic. The baby, the fetus, was diagnosed to have an intrapericardial teratoma. And this teratoma, this teratoma was huge uh, when compared to the size of the fetus. And it was uh, compressing on the heart and producing heart failure. Uh, without the removal of the tumor, uh, the fetus wouldn't have survived. Uh, hence, at 26 weeks of age, the mother was taken up for uh, surgery and the fetus underwent uh, surgical removal of the tumor. Uh, this is the uh, multidisciplinary team performing, performing the uh, surgery. And I was, uh, I was able to see the video of the uh, actual surgery being performed. It was really heartwarming to see the uh, uh, therapeutic procedure, this complex therapeutic procedure being done in a fetus. And the uh, child after uh, underwent the successful uh, birth and then is surviving as a normal child now. Very interesting field of uh, innovation. So, so summary, to summarize, uh, successful pediatric cardiac care involves pushing boundaries across generations and this has helped to uh, reach the present state of excellent pediatric cardiac care. And so the future is bright for children with complex congenital heart diseases. New treatment options are being ra uh, rapidly developed. And one uh, important thing which has to happen more is more government funding and more private participation. This will definitely help, will go a long way in, in improving and standardizing pediatric cardiac care. So we, everyone should realize that healthy children are a nation's asset. This, this statement, this AYR's statement, is very true in pediatric cardiac care. And we keep learning in each and every case, even daily. Thank you. We hope the knowledge shared during the webinar will be valuable in your daily practice, ultimately benefiting the well-being of your patients. Thank you for being an integral part of our webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sir.